Hi everyone and welcome to the rise of the Inca Empire. Archaeologists have typically divided a Peruvian and Andean history more broadly into a series of developmental periods beginning with the initial period in which we see the development of ceramics and agricultural production. We then move through time as settlements become larger, more hierarchical, and develop more sophisticated types of architecture and material, cult material culture. This kind of developmental sequence concludes in what's called the Late Horizon, dating from roughly 1450 to 1550 AD. During the Late Horizon period, we see the emergence and fluorescence of the Incan Empire. So today I want to start with the Middle Horizon period, which stretches from roughly 550 to 1000 CE. A key archaeological site and civilization during this period is called Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is the highest city in the ancient world, sitting at 12,600 feet. At the height of its occupation, Tiwanaku had an estimated population of roughly 20,000 people occupying the city between 400 and 1000 CE. Architecture, sculpture, roads, all had a significant influence on later Inca civilization, and we find the first archeological evidence for them at Tiwanaku. We also see the construction of large residential buildings arranged into compounds using a mud brick technique and a high dependence on agricultural production using canal and aqueduct systems to support this large population aggregation at Tiwanaku. Tiwanakuan civilization dominated the area from the Peruvian coast up into northern Bolivia and Chile. It offers us the earliest archaeological evidence for monumental buildings in the highland region of the Andes and was rooted in an economy based on llama herding and irrigation farming. These facets of Tiwanakuan civilization are continued into the Incan civilization that we'll talk about for the majority of today's class. So around 1000 CE, we see that the centralized authority at Tiwanaku begins to fray and a political vacuum of small competing states emerges. This period of decentralization and conflict is known as the Late Intermediate Period. Following this period of conflict and war, this political vacuum was filled by the Incan state. The Incan Empire itself flourished in the lowland and highland regions of the Andes from roughly 100, for roughly 100 years, beginning in the mid-15th century. The traditional homeland of the Inca lie to the northwest of the Titicaca Basin surrounding what is now Cusco. Originally, Incan civilization was rooted in small-scale farming activities and smaller dispersed villages organized by kin groups known as Ayu. Ayu leaders contributed labor to one another as a means of organizing and distributing work reciprocally. It was believed that divine ancestors protected the Ayus and legitimized land ownership within these small village structures. The Incan Empire that evolved from these small village structures in the highland and lowland regions of Peru drew on a religious belief system developed by other Andean civilizations like Tiwanaku. According to Incan mythology, in the, most, in, most, in the most ancient times, the earth was covered in darkness. Then, out of Lake Titicaca, the god Veracocha emerged, bringing humans with him into the current world. 
Viracocha also created the sun, called Inti, and the moon, as well as the stars. Out of the great rocks found throughout the Andean region, including women who were already pregnant to have offspring that would become the Inca. Viracocha sent the Inca emperor is said to have descended directly. Inca rulers made regular pilgrimage, pilgrimages to the site of Lake Titicaca to worship at the temple of the sun god and to relive their origins rooted in the lake. Incan religion really focused on controlling the natural world and avoiding major natural disasters like floods or droughts. Sacred sites were established across the landscape and were associated with prominent natural features like mountains and caves. These cave structures were called huacas and used to take astronomical observations at certain times of the year. Religious ceremonies linked to astronomical calendars and observations, as well as charting the movement of the sun and moon, very similar to what we see at Chaco and Cahokia, were a central facet of Incan religious life. These, ri these rituals were linked to ancestor worship. The practice of mummification and making offerings to gods of food, drink, and previous materials was a key feature of this kind of religious complex rooted in ancestor worship. We also see that Incan, Incan religious officials would sacrifice animals as well as humans and children in order to pacify and honor their gods, like Veracoche. The Incan societies of the past paid particular attention to developing a formal royal ancestor cult. Although ancestor cults were a long-standing part of Andean society, what was new about what was called the Pat Pachacuti system was the institution of split inheritance which accompanied this cult. Basically, when a ruler died, his palace, servants, and possessions were still considered his property and were maintained by all of his male descendants except his direct successor, which is really different than what we see in terms of uh, kind of a hereditary rule in places like Europe, in which your direct descendant gets all of your possessions. In the Incan context, the direct successor got nothing, and instead, all of, these, all of this wealth was given to uh, the other male descendants in the group. Importantly, within Incan religious belief systems, the deceased weren't considered exactly dead. Something, a, a facet of Incan society that really draws on the Game of Thrones idea of what is dead may never die. Instead, the deceased were considered a link between the living and the gods. So the dead were believed to actually attend ceremonies and to visit the houses of the living. Critically, the possessions of the deceased were maintained by male descendants, not his successor. So a new king had to acquire wealth in order to maintain his royal lifestyle and to provide for his mummy in the future. This practice of mummification involved bodies being placed in a fetal position and wrapped into bundles, like the one depicted behind me. The bodies themselves were preserved using salt and placed in caves or dedicated rooms within the community. At Cusco, the capital of the Incan Empire, there was a dedicated space within the what's called the Coracancha religious complex for mummified remains of former Inca emperors 
as well as their wives. Within these chambers, the mummified rulers were surrounded by their weapons and artistic treasures. So the big idea here is that the direct successor to the Incan imperial throne actually didn't maintain any wealth when they became emperor. Instead, they had to demonstrate that they could earn that wealth, and then they took that wealth with them into the afterlife because it was believed that the dead actually did not remain dead after they passed away, but instead became critical intermediaries between the living and the gods. As I mentioned, the capital of the Incan Empire was at Cusco. This Cusco itself is the longest continuously occupied city in the Western Hemisphere, and at its height had a population around 200,000 people. The city is laid out in the form of a puma, with the kind of imperial city of Puma Chupan forming the tail and the temple complex forming the head. Between these were a series of vast networks of plazas, parklands, shrines, fountains, and canals surrounded on the outskirts by agricultural complexes. Cusco itself was dominated by a sacred gold-covered and emerald-studded Cora Concha complex, which was the temple to the sun god. This temple was built in honor of the sun god Iti and, as, and Mama Kila, the moon goddess. It's lined with 700 sheets of beaten gold. It's said that after taking Cusco, the Spanish conquistadors demolished the Cora Concha temple and built a cathedral on top of it. Perhaps the most famous city associated with the Incan Empire is that of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu was a royal estate and sacred religious center rather than a residential complex like Cusco. It was built at the height of the Incan Empire by the Emperor Pachacutec in the 15th century and abandoned around 1530 when the Spanish arrived. Machu Picchu itself covers five miles. It was built originally as a refuge for the elite of the Inca aristocracy and probably had a standing population of about a thousand people. Machu Picchu also served as a fortress and sacred site. Its location on top of these uh, extreme kind of hill terraced areas was very strategic. Surrounded by steep cliffs and away from the sight of strangers, it had a kind of narrow entrance allowing, uh, in the case of a surprise attack, to be defended by just a few warriors. The need for fortification at Machu Picchu sprang from a series of severe droughts in the region, which made competition for resources fierce. At Machu Picchu, there's roughly 200 structures. The city is divided into two major districts. On the west side of the city is the kind of sacred space that contained a central complex of closely packed buildings arranged around a central square, around which you also see a kind of series of terraces used, as, used for farming. On the eastern and southern side of Machu Picchu, you see the residential complexes based on these kind of single room dwellings with enclosed patios. Over 3,000 stone steps link these different portions of Machu Picchu, as well as different elevations of the city itself. Perhaps the most impressive structure at Machu Picchu is the Torreon, a distinctive D-shaped bit of masonry. One of the windows of this tower is aligned with Pleiades, allowing this building to serve as a key site for astronomical observations. 
Incan society itself was organized into 12 age divisions for the purposes of census taking and taxation. These divisions were based on physical changes linked to puberty and major social events like marriage. Of course, the royalty uh, and Incan emperor were at the top, followed by nobility and then the commoners. Incan rulers developed an efficient administrative system to organize this complex hierarchical relationship. The empire was divided into four large provinces known as Suyus. Each of these provinces was divided into smaller, into smaller regional provinces, which were ruled over by uh, local family members known as Kuraka. These people were appointed by the king to serve as a kind of nexus point between the royal house in Cusco and these regional settlements, uh, both in the highlands and lowlands of the empire. Textile cords were used for record keeping and census taking rather than written language. These cords were called quipus. They're long kind of textile cords with varying numbers of pendant cords dropping off from it. These cords each contain knots, as well as different cord lengths, thicknesses, and colors, which all had important meanings in terms of census taking. The quipu were complex and sophisticated forms of record keeping that seems to make up for the lack of writing within this complex empire. These instruments were also used to codify laws and to provide taxation data to inspectors. At the time of Spanish conquest in the early 16th century, the Inca controlled the lives of as many as 6 million people who primarily lived in small dispersed villages. In these villages, artisans produced the majority of textiles and pottery, which were given to the imperial state as a form of tax. The Inca also created distinctive art styles that used symbols of, that were used as symbols of imperial dominance. For example, polished metal works like the giant sun image depicted behind me. Gold in particular was considered the sweat of the sun and silver considered the tears of the moon. So these natural resources were actually embedded within the cosmological worldviews of the Inca Empire itself. These kind of precious metals, gold and silver, were made exclusively for the consumption of Incan nobles. Commoners, in addition to producing these elaborate uh, exotic uh, pieces of silver and gold artwork uh, and pottery, were the primary producers of maize which was sent to Cusco as tribute to the emperor. Importantly, in this context, llama fertilizer was actually used to help uh, fertilize corn growth within high altitude areas, which are a very different, difficult context to grow corn in because of the very short growing season and the lack of water in these areas. So llama fertilizer actually reduced dependency on other crops like quinoa and boosted caloric intake for Incan commoners. Agriculture was really at the center of Incan life. One important product central to Incan life that was produced through maize is the alcoholic beverage called chicha, which developed as early as 5000 BC. Chicha is made by chewing maize and spitting it back into a container. Brewers then use these natural enzymes from their saliva to convert this high, starch, high starch content of maize into sugar. This chewed corn is then boiled and strained. Chicha was an elite beverage imbued with social, economic, and supernatural significance throughout South America. The earliest pottery in the region was actually likely intended for this alcoholic beverage. 
In addition to being consumed by the royal court, chicha was used as a form of payment for workers, as well as an offering to gods and ancestors. For example, at Cusco, during an annual festival, the king would pour chicha into a gold bowl at the navel of the universe. A stone dies with, dies with a throne and pillar in the central plaza. Chicha would then cascade down what was called the gullet of the sun god to the, to the temple of the sun. Furthermore, human sacrifices first had to be rubbed in the dregs of chicha and then tube fed more chicha for days while lying buried alive in tombs. Mummies of previous kings and ancestors were actually ritually bathed in maize and presented with chicha as offerings. Even today, people in Peru will sprinkle some chicha to Mother Earth when they sit down and drink together. Another important agricultural crop that was central to the Incan Empire was coca. According to the Inca, coca originated from a mythical woman named Cuca, who was so beautiful that none in the entire empire could resist her. Aware of her power, Cuca used her charms to take advantage of men until word of her misdeeds reached the great Inca's ears. He ordered that she be sacrificed, cut in half, and buried. From her grave, a miraculous plant sprouted. It gave strength and vigor and alleviated pain and suffering. The people called it coca in honor of that beautiful and irresistible woman. Unprocessed leaves from the coca plant can be enjoyed by chewing them or by brewing them in tea. Coca was cultivated and harvested by the people that the Inca conquered and served as another type of tribute given to nobles at Cusco. Public officials and regional lords were paid for their services to the empire in baskets of coca leaves. These leaves were also given out to soldiers at feasts to celebrate victories. Because of its high value, coca was largely consumed by imperial Inca elites rather than commoners. But there is evidence from the end of the Inca empire that restrictions on coca consumption relaxed and became more widely available to commoners. Coca, as I've mentioned, was considered sacred to the Inca and was used in all sorts of religious ceremonies, very similar to chicha. Spanish priests observed that the Inca would burn coca leaves and blow the fumes towards the sun to uh, foster healing the sick. Coca was also buried with the dead and included among their grave goods to accompany them into the afterlife. Coca also played a role in ritual sacrifice. Three mummies of sacrificial victims discovered in 1999 within the Inca sites revealed high consumptions of coca in the months preceding their deaths. Consuming coca leaves was believed to induce a kind of holy existential trance. This altered state disoriented sacrificial victims, making them easier to subdue. This entire network of Inca polities were connected by an elaborate road system which covered over 40,000 kilometers. This coordinated system ha had regular rest houses and nearly 10,000 way stations that allowed the, the empire to move armies, goods, and send messengers from one end of the kingdom all the way to the other. Ultimately, the Incan Empire was founded on and maintained by force. As a result, the ruling class was often unpopular with their subjects. During the 15th century, the empire became overextended due to war in, wars in Ecuador, where the second Inca capital had been established. At this time, the Inca were also hit by an epidemic of European diseases, especially smallpox. 
This wave of disease is estimated to have killed 65 to 90 percent of the Incan population. Toxic European germs combined with more advanced military techniques allowed the Spanish to topple the Incan Empire.